I am so excited to be here today. And um, Nick and I just so love this house. You're like, in case you're wondering, um, you know, I've been coming here for like eight years, but many of you may not have ever been here when I've, I've been here. I am your crazy Greek aunt from Australia. And so every church needs a crazy Greek aunt. And so that's the one that I am, just so that you all know. I'm, I'm way beyond a guest. I'm just part of the, the family. And so we, well, Nick and I love you guys. Um, I've got a picture, I think. I've got my two little girls. We uh, have, ca- there's my, oh, no, you can put that back up because he's very cute. I like to look at him. <laughs> He'll be here in the next service. He's on his way now. And so he is the most ravishing piece of masculine flesh uh, on planet Earth. We've been married for 22 years, and so that's pretty awesome. Um, And then that's my firstborn, Catherine Bobby. And then I've got my secondborn is Sophia Joyce. And so they're my... uh, I I call them my Alpha my Omega. My husband is the 14th of 15 children. His his mother had 15 full-term pregnancies in 17 years. And every woman's just crossed her legs right there. And I just wish you could just (laughs) see what I could see right now. It was just like, whoa. And, um, you know, there was no television in that part of Australia. Absolutely. And so... (laughs) Um, so my, my mother-in-law did not think you were a chick until you like popped out number 10. You know, she thought you weren't even worth being a woman. And so I would like take my daughters to her house and go, you know, this is Catherine, Alpha, and this is Sophia, Omega. They are the beginning and the end of my <laughs> childbearing years. And, you know, I had to put that in. So uh, anyway, that's our, our family. And I want to thank you because... Whether you realise it or not, this house, right from the beginning, has been such a, um, a generous contributor to the A21 campaign. Nick and I oversee A21, uh, which is we help to rescue the victims of human trafficking around the world. And we have 15 officers um, around the world. And, and this house has been so key. We just flew into West Palm from Barcelona, where we opened our um, 15th office. And it's just amazing to see what God is doing. And just so, there's barely, nowadays, um, barely a day goes by with, without someone being rescued. When we started A21, if we had a rescue a year, it was kind of like um, miraculous. And I, I remember then thinking, God, I want, you know, um, b- back then I want one, one a month, and then I wanted, you know, one a week, and then I wanted one a day, and then one an hour, I want one a second now. If there's 40 million slaves on the earth, why can't we see people set free all the time? And it seemed impossible back then, Um, but we're seeing God do amazing things. And I've got a photo because last, uh, we got a letter in December, we got in November to fly out in December to India. And I thought at first, I didn't think it was for real, Um, but it was uh, from the Harmony Foundation, which oversees, it's the the, um, organisation that oversees the Mother Teresa uh, trust and it's the only kind of um, proper uh, um, organisation that does that. And they had the uh, Mother Teresa Social Justice Award, um, and A21 was the recipient of that award in December. But just to put it into context, um, the year before us, the Dalai Lama got it, and Malala got it the year before that, and Doctors Without Borders without uh, be, the year before that. So it was quite uh, an awesome thing to be recognised at that level. And over here. Um, we were like in India as I'm in the full garb and the gentleman that was giving me the award is Gandhi's great-grandson. And it was like so surreal. I felt like I was in a movie. Like really, I just kind of wanted to pull out my cell phone and go, can we take a selfie? But anyway, I, I didn't do that. And so I, I acted really cool, but I really wasn't like cool at all. Anyway, so um, I want to say thank you with all of that. God is doing amazing things. Why don't you turn with me this morning to the book of John, chapter 5. And um, I love the Word of God. Anyone else love the Word of God? You've come ready to receive today. I love this. John chapter 5. The Bible says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Of course, there was three major feast days in the Jewish calendar. And commentators would say this was probably the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus, of course, who was Jewish, was going to go back to Jerusalem for this feast. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool 
in Aramaic called Bethesda. In Aramaic, that pool is, the word Bethesda means a house of grace. In Hebrew, it's a house of mercy. So there is a pool. I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but if you have, you, you can see all of this. It says, um, which, is, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitudes of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So basically you have the pool of Bethesda. Jesus came in via the sheep gate, and that's obviously where the shepherds came. And then the pool was split in two. On one side, all the sheep and the animals were washed. On the other side, people would go in. And so it says there were five colonnades. So around the pool were like five porches with a cover over each porch. And it says there were a multitude of invalids at in those porches. And there were people that were lame and there were people that were blind and there was a multitude. There's never just one. There's, there's a multitude. And so this is where we are in the story. It goes on. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. You know, I always laugh when I read that in Scripture. It's like, of course, Jesus knew because, like, he's God, so he knows everything. So it's not like, wow, how did Jesus know? Uh, he's God. It's a perk of being God. But anyway, so um, it says, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. I, I just want you to see the absurdity of that. The, the man had been lying there for 38 years, but this is what religion says. No, 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 this is the wrong day. Uh, this is not the day for you to pick up that mat. And we, we lose sight of the miracle because it's not done in the way that we want. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing all these things on the Sabbath. I mean, that's a good reason to persecute Jesus. He was healing people on the Sabbath. I mean, seriously, couldn't you get your days right, Jesus? That is not when it should have happened. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. So here we are. It's such an interesting story. Now, I know that's a lot of Bible for a Sunday morning. That's more verses than some of you have read all week, but that's okay. I've just caught you up in your Bible reading plan. You're going to finish your one-year Bible now. That's awesome. And so basically in this story, Jesus turns up and he turns up for the, the feast of tabernacles. And um, here they are, five porches of invalids, of lame people, of sick people, lying around, waiting, hoping, wishing that they would be healed. Because what happened was the Pool of Bethesda, it had an underwater spring. When that spring would bubble, the waters would overflow. And that would happen once every, maybe not even once every year. But the person that would get in the pool first when that happened would be healed. So can you imagine, there are people, multitudes of invalids, lying down there, wishing, hoping that they would be the one that would get in that pool. Do you know how frustrating it would be? One guy, the Bible says, was there for 38 years. How frustrating it would be for 38 years to be looking at a future that you can't touch, to be looking at a healing that you can't reach. 38 years, I mean, what was his perspective on life lying on his back? I wonder whether his parents would bring him here when he was first born and, and then I'd wonder when they, whether they just kind of dropped him off as he got older and just waited and thought maybe this will be the day, maybe this will be the day. Four decades of his life, just about, was spent on his back hoping that he would be healed. A lot of us, metaphorically speaking, come to church, but this is where we're at in our life. We're lying on our back, our perspective is skewed and we 
wish that we could be the ones that would be healed in that pool. We wish we could be the ones that the sermons would apply to. We wish we could be the ones that, that, that there would be healing, but somehow we're just still stuck on our back week after week, month after month, year after year, and then we get there and it's four decades later and nothing's really changed. We're on our back. And the Bible says that there was multitudes and they were each gathered around their infirmity because have you ever noticed that misery loves company? And so you're not gonna sit there on your own. You, you tend to to attract people that are just like you. Have you noticed that I've been in church life now for three decades and you notice all of the naysayers, all of the negative people, they, they find each other. It's like a magnet. They just find each other and sit together. All the, all the gossipers, they just find each other and they're all in the, the same section. You know, all the, all the traditionalists, all the conservatives, all the progressives, they all just find each other because that's what happens is people love to congregate around their issues. You just get on social media and people find each other around their issues. You just got to put a hashtag in front of it and all of a sudden you've got 25 friends that will find you around your issue, whether it's misery, whether it's rejection, whether it's offence, whether it's hurt or whether it's joy or it's around a sporting game. People love to gather around their issues and if they've got something that they want to complain about, they're going to find 25 other people that are going to sit around those colonnades and they're going to be around with them in their issue and eventually... You've talked about your issues so much, you don't even know who you are anymore because all you know is your issue. Now, I know no one in this room's got any issues. I'm not talking about the 11 o'clock or whatever service we are. I'm talking about the 8.30 service. They had all the issues. So the fact is, a lot of us, we think we don't, we don't have any issues. But if I was to ask your spouse or your neighbour sitting right next to you, your friend, you can look straight ahead right now, but I guarantee you they could name one or two Issues, you, you find people, hey, don't bring that up around her because she's going to explode, you know, then she's got an issue with that. You, some of you deliberately came into church through a different door so you wouldn't bump into the person that you're having an issue with on the other side of, not in this church, you're all Christians. I'm just talking about all the other churches in West Palm. But it's like a, an issue and, and eventually you have no identity anymore. Your identity is in your issue, in what they did to you, what they said to you, where you've come from, what your socioeconomic background was. It, it's all about the issue. The Bible is full of people, full of people that we don't know their names. We just, we just know their issues because people with issues prefer to be accepted rather than changed. They, they wanna be affirmed rather than changed. They wanna be comforted in their misery rather than changed. They wanna be enabled rather than changed. And, and you see it. You see, people eventually get their identity in their condition. Well, this is just how I am. This is just, this is just what it is. And, and, and my whole identity is framed around whatever issue. Now, in the Bible, we have, in Luke chapter eight, we have the woman with the issue of blood. We don't know her name, but we know her issue. The Samaritan woman in, in John chapter four, we, we don't know her name, but we know her issue with five husbands. We, the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter eight. We don't know her name, but we know her issue. The man born blind in John chapter nine. We don't know his name, but we know his issue. The demoniac in Mark five. The leper in Mark one. The deaf and mute man. We, we don't know their names, but we know their issues. I wonder if you've become so defined by your issue that you no longer remember your name, that you no longer remember that you are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. I've come looking for the one today. I've come looking for the one that wants to be renamed today, that you don't wanna be named according to your issue or according to the label that society puts on you, but you wanna be named according to what the Scripture says about you, that you are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I've come looking for the one because Jesus turned up and He said there was one man. Now remember the text has already told us there was a multitude. Oh, I've given up looking for the multitudes. I've given, I, I've started looking for the one in the multitudes. That's what, what I'm doing with my time left on this earth. Where's the one? I've come for the one. Because there's always a multitude of invalids, but there's only one that's gonna wanna get healed. There's always a multitude that are gonna sit around their issues, but there's only one that's gonna wanna be healed. So Jesus turns up to the one. Can you imagine what that would have looked like on social media? Jesus turn, ignores all the rest of them. Oh, doesn't Jesus have compassion? What about all the rest of them? The Bible says He went up to one. And then not only that, He didn't get down and go, oh, you poor little man. You poor thing, I know it's so hard. And I know 
that you've just been so oppressed. I know it's just so bad and you're lying here and I'm just gonna lie here with you and we're just all gonna lie together and we're gonna start a hashtag and we're gonna go on Twitter and we're just gonna tell everyone how bad it is to be lying by the pool. I just feel you. I just affirm you. Let's just stay here together. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but Jesus actually would have been kicked out of most churches, pastoral care teams. Jesus would have been fired because Jesus turns up to the dude and he says to him, hey mate, that's the Australian version. Hey mate, do you wanna be healed? Could you imagine? That would be front page of all the newspapers. Jesus Christ has zero compassion. He turns up to Bethesda to the infirm man and says to him, do you wanna be healed? I mean, what a lack of compassion that is. What do you mean does he wanna be healed? He's been lying there for 38 years. Of course the man wants to be healed. I mean, that church has no compassion. No compassion. Do you want to be healed in the Greek? That means do you want to be made whole? Because there's a lot of people that would prefer to lie on the mat rather than be made whole. What Jesus was saying to him was, do you want to accept the responsibility that comes with healing? See, it's a lot easier to lie on a mat and remain a victim for the rest of your life because you expect everyone to feel sorry for you. But there comes responsibility with healing and wholeness. You know, I was born in in Sydney, Australia too, and I found out at 33 years old, that I was adopted, I had no idea. I grew up thinking one set of parents were my parents, didn't find out that they weren't. And then went on to find out that I had been left in a hospital when I was born, unnamed and unwanted. That my birth certificate does not have a name on it. It simply says child's name, unnamed. Number 2508 of 1966. I grew up in the poorest zip code in our state, the third poorest zip code in the whole of Australia in government assisted housing. Second generation migrant Greek, Uh, before my big fat Greek wedding when it was not cool to be Greek in Australia at all. (laughs) Very marginalised because of my ethnicity in in a culture that did not esteem women at all. And I was sexually abused for 12 years by several different men. And so I was so broken. I I was lying on the mat for years. I was lying on the mat of unforgiveness. I was lying on the mat of bitterness. I was lying on the mat of offence. I was lying on the mat of shame. I was lying on the mat of anger. I was lying on the mat of blame. I was lying on the mat of guilt. And you know what? Everyone understood because society will do that. You know, Christine, I, you know, no wonder you are like you are. No wonder you're just angry and bitter because look what happened to you. There's a reason for it. There's a justifiable reason for it. And so, you know, Christine, we're just gonna keep you on that mat. We're just gonna keep you on that mat. But Jesus doesn't wanna keep us on that mat. Jesus says, Christine, I know what happened to you, but what I did for you was bigger than what happened to you. So if you could understand what I did for you at Calvary was greater than anything that happened to you. So Jesus says, do you wanna be made well? And you and I are currently living in a culture that's saying, affirm, that's affirming our victimhood. They're saying, just stay on that mat, you poor thing. It's not your fault, it's the system's fault. It's everybody else's fault. And Jesus says, we live in a broken and a fallen world, but I've overcome the powers of darkness. So if you wanna be made well, I can make you well. You can get up off that mat and you can walk and you can walk in freedom and you can walk in liberty. Now imagine if I didn't get up off the mat. You know, in six weeks, we've got a walk for freedom at A21. Over 400 walks across the world in 56 nations around the earth. If I didn't get up and walk, there wouldn't be over 50,000 people walking for freedom. There wouldn't be 15 A21 officers around the world. There wouldn't be propel around the world. On the other side of your obedience is fruitfulness. The enemy wants to keep you on the mat because he wants to thwart your destiny. He wants to hold you back from everything that Jesus has for you. It's not an issue of your salvation. You can stay on the mat and be miserable, but it's an issue of your fruitfulness and your obedience setting many others free on the other side of you getting up and taking up your mat and walking. So Jesus says, do you want to? Because there's a cost with it. There's a cost to picking up your mat. You know, I I had a ski accident a few years ago. I um, was with Nick and five other American families and um, I 
it was during the Vancouver Winter Olympics, so I'd never skied. I would watch the Olympics at night and then try out what I watched uh, on the next day. And um, I was like representing Australia. I was going to do this thing. And um, anyway, I got on the ski lift and I, like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. So this day I went on this like flat green slope, you know, like it's got n- nothing. And the, all the boys were going on the double black diamond suicide run, you know. And um, I, Nick came with me. And as we were skiing that day, I, I said to him, hey, Nick, um, if you were with the boys today, you wouldn't be having any more fun then you're having on this flat green slope with me, would you? And, um, you know, any man that's married and wants to remain that way, the right answer, <laughs> the, right, the right answer in that moment is always to say, you know, honey, there is nowhere I would rather be than on this nice flat slope with you. You know, if you wanted any action that night, that's exactly what you would say to your wife, just putting it out there, just good marriage tip. And, um, but my husband, being a man of integrity, says... <laughs> Babe, if I was with the guys, I'd be having a much better time right now. Now, that's like putting a red rag in front of a bull. And so I said to him, famous last words, I look over my shoulder, I went, well, sweetheart, eat my snow. And I put my skis, went down, and about 20 seconds later, I knew I was in extreme trouble on my second somersault that was not planned. And while I was in midair, one ski went flying off, the other stayed, and I heard the loudest pop, pop, pop um, that you've ever heard. And I snapped my ACL, tore my MCL, tore my meniscus, and fractured my knee. I did it all. So anyway, um, I had surgery in Australia. They do a hamstring graft. And um, the doctor, the PT, comes in after the surgery. And he says to me, Mrs. Kane, he goes, you have a choice here. The kind of injury that you have, it was so severe. If you're a professional athlete, you know, you, you would more than likely never play professional sport again. He said, but you can recover from this injury. He said, technically, your right knee is now actually stronger than your left knee because of the hamstring graft. But here is the deal. Most people never recover from the kind of injury you've had, not because they can't, but because they won't, because the pain of recovery is far greater than the pain of the injury. The injury took one second to happen, but the recovery is gonna take several months for you to come back. Now you can come back completely or partially, you can come back quickly or slowly. It is entirely up to you. The degree to which you are willing to embrace the pain of recovery is the degree to which you will recover. And the thing that I have found is a whole lot of Christians prefer to stay on the mat, not because Jesus won't set us free, but because you are not willing to embrace the pain of recovery. And if we are willing to embrace the pain of recovery, we would see a life beyond our past. Church, nothing will change my past. The blood of Jesus does not give you amnesia. I was abused for 12 years. Nothing will change that. But next month, I'm 52 years old. So send me lots of presents, please. And so that means that although I was abused for 12 years, I have not been being abused for 40 years. Why would I allow the enemy to have any more than the 12 years that he had? I haven't been being abused for a lot longer than I have. But I had to embrace the pain of recovery that comes with picking up your mat and walking. And a lot of us would rather lie on our backs and remain victims rather than embrace the pain of recovery. When Jesus says, I oh, know oh, I can set you free. I'm living proof. I'm living proof that you can start bad and finish good in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm living proof that there is a life beyond your past. But Jesus comes and that's why He says, do, do you want to be made whole? Because you will only be made whole to the degree you want to be. See, I wanted to be. I wanted to be free. I wanted to be made whole. I wanted to fulfill my destiny. I wanted to have a fruitful life. I couldn't believe it when someone said to me 30 years ago that my past didn't have to define my future, that my history didn't need to be my destiny. Now, it's been painful to work that out, but the fruitfulness has been so worth it The people saved, the people delivered, the people healed. The enemy wants you to think you can't get up off the mat because if he can't get your soul, you're saved. 
He wants everyone that you would have influenced if you got off the mat. That's what's at stake right now. That's what's at stake. And so we have this victim mentality rampant in our world right now because the enemy wants to keep people on the mat so that people are not reached for the sake of the gospel. And so what happens is this man, when Jesus says, do you wanna be made well? Do you notice that he doesn't say yes? I mean, what planet are you on? Nearly four decades he's been lying there and someone says to him, do you wanna be made whole? But he answers with two, two answers. He says to him, look, it's, it's, not, um, it's not my fault. There's no one to put me in the pool. There's the blame victim mentality. Instead of saying yes to Jesus, he says, I've, I've got no one to put me in the pool. And he's the one standing before him that can bring healing. And he's not saying yes to Jesus because he's blaming people for not putting him in the pool. Some of us are not saying yes to Jesus because we're still blaming our father that died 30 years ago that wasn't there. Or an ex-lover or an ex-spouse or some teacher that said you're dumb, you're stupid or something that's happened. And Jesus is going, do you wanna be made well? And you're like, but they didn't do it. And my mum walked out and my dad wasn't there and this person abused. And Jesus is like, I'm standing here. I'm standing here. I know that they're not here. Some of you are still blaming the ex-husband that walked away and you're thinking about him, 38 years. No one's worth 38 years of your life, honey. He's been remarried twice, got 16 great grandchildren. He is not thinking about you. Nobody is worth 38 years of your life. Nobody. I've got nobody to put me in the pool. I didn't know someone didn't send me the checks. Someone didn't give me the break. And Jesus is going, that, that's why I'm here. Everyone else gets in first. No one ever cuts me any slack. Everyone else, I mean, the guy comes up with excuses rather than a yes. I wonder how often we do that in church life. Rather than saying yes to Jesus, we give him a list of everything that hasn't happened and everyone that hasn't helped us and everyone that's offended us and everyone that's hurt us. I'm not minimizing the pain of that. I, I, I prefaced it by saying the pain of recovery is very real, but it's not impossible. We just have to be willing to walk through it because on the other side of it, people, people are on the other side of it. Generations are on the other side of it. And so the fact is that you gotta make a decision. He says, Jesus said to him, I want you to take up your bed and walk. Now here's the other thing that Jesus did that is not highly compassionate. Jesus told him to do something he couldn't do. He was an invalid. And Jesus said, okay, I'm gonna put the stretch on you, the pain of recovery. That thing that has been carrying you, I want you to pick it up and carry it. And what Jesus is saying to many of us is that thing that you've been lying on, that has been carrying you, that you've been using as an excuse, I need you to pick it up and I need you to carry it so that people can see that it's not carrying you any longer, that Jesus is carrying you, that Jesus is the one that's bringing your breakthrough, that Jesus is the one that can bring healing and wholeness in your life. Can you imagine? If he didn't do that, I'm thinking if I didn't walk, there would be no walk for freedom. There would be no everything that I'm doing. It didn't just, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth and someone didn't roll out the red carpet. At some point, I had to make a decision. I wanna be healed. At some point, I had to make a decision to pick up my mat and walk. So we'll have over 400 walks for freedom all over the world, 50,000 plus walkers. It'll be on every major network. We've got A21 in every major airport in the world. None of that would exist if I didn't get up off the mat. And I think sometimes we prefer to applaud other people getting off the mat rather than saying, I am going to embrace the pain of recovery and get up off my own mat and walk into the future that Jesus has for me. And so then the interesting thing is, is he's carrying the mat and Jesus goes and finds him in the temple. Well, before he does that, did you notice all the Pharisees and all the religious people are like, why'd you get healed on a Saturday, on the Sabbath? I mean, that's what religion wants to keep you on the mat. Legalism, religion, naysayers, they don't want you to get up because you getting up is very threatening to them. See, there are some Christians that would think, I wish Chris came, wouldn't stand up and say Jesus healed her. 
because then I can't see some of you. That's the problem. You've been complaining about your issue, and so now the person that you're sitting next to, you won't be able to complain about that same issue when you leave today because they'll be like, seriously, honey, if she could get over it, you could get over it. See, I, I, that's just, I'm, I'm frustrating to those sort of people because they're like, really, did you have to say, Christine, that you could get over it? Because I've been complaining about this for 20 years. Some of you, you're just going to have to get a new issue after today, that's for sure. And so that's what happens. Oftentimes when someone else, you go, okay, that's very confronting. Because your excuse, it's just your excuse, like that man. I've got no one else to put me in the pool. Everyone jumps in first. Well, someone else is standing here going, oh no, if you want to get up and walk, you can. Because it's not in my personality type and it's, not, it's got nothing to do with my personality. It's got nothing to do with anything in me. I didn't make myself get up and walk. Jesus is the power that makes us get up and walk. And so it's a Jesus issue. And Jesus can do it for you just like he did it for me. But here is the deal. Religion doesn't want you to get up because I can control you when you're on the mat and, and we don't have to believe God for anything supernatural or anything great. You don't even need faith to lie on the mat. You just need an opinion and you need to complain. And in the 21st century, you need a Twitter account. That's all you need. And you could just stay on the mat and you could just think that you've done something. You, you don't need anything. But I'll tell you what else will keep you on the mat. Remember when Jesus went into the temple and found the man and that's a fascinating thing because when he got up off the mat, for the first time in 38 years, this man went into the temple. He'd never been in the temple before that because your healing will give you access to places you've never been to before. And so it is so crucial that you understand that God wants to heal you, to take you and expose you to things you've never been exposed to, to places you've never been exposed to, to people that you've never been exposed to. And he, Jesus goes in there. He says, look, you're, you're healed. And then he said to him, Make sure you don't sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. That's in the Bible. That's in the red letters of Jesus. You know, we're very big on the red letters of Jesus currently in society. So I want you to know this is the red letters of Jesus too. Go and sin no more so that nothing worse will happen. So what will keep you, what will keep you on the mat is religious legalism, but what will also put you back on the mat is license. So when you think you've just got a license to do whatever you wanna do, because I've got the grace of God so I can live however I wanna live, you, you can, but you get to choose whether you're gonna live on the mat or whether you're gonna walk in the freedom and liberty and fullness of the destiny that God has for you. It's your choice. It's your choice. And the band can come and, you know, if you're not gonna do it, if you're not gonna get off the mat for you, because you just think, look, I, I don't care. I, I like where I'm seated. seated. I, I like my life and I like the view from the mat. I wonder if you'd consider getting off the mat maybe for the, the generations that are to come after you. The thing that we're fighting for right now in this nation, it's a generational issue. The, the enemy has unleashed a, a victimhood spirit and a divisive spirit and an angry spirit because if he could keep us all on the mat, it's not just about us, it's about the generations that are going to come after us. And you can make a difference if you make a decision to stop blaming, to stop, to stop putting excuses of why you're not walking in the fullness of the destiny that God has for you. It is to our Father's great glory, John says, to bear much fruit, not just a little bit of fruit, but much fruit. God's got a lot more for us to do at Christ's fellowship. And it needs all of us to be getting up off the mat and stepping into the fullness of what it is that He has for us. It's to His great glory that we bear much fruit. But you know, I um, when I was speaking at a conference very close to, um, Stratford-upon-Avon in England where William Shakespeare was born and wrote all his works. And I studied Shakespeare at Sydney University. I'm an English major. So basically I've got a degree in English and economic history so I can read golden books and count to 10 basically. And so we, I, I love Shakespeare. And so I thought I'm gonna go, since I'm so close, I'm gonna go and visit Willie. And um, I went to his house, but because he died a couple of hundred years ago, he wasn't there, but that was awesome. I went anyway. And so across the road from his house, there was like a genealogy shop, you know, where you go in and you type in the name and it spits out the genealogy. Now, because my husband, Nick, is his mum's British, I thought, this was before the royal wedding, I thought I might be getting an invitation to the wedding. I had just rewatched Downton Abbey and I'm thinking awesome maybe we've got a castle somewhere in England and you know that where he's he might be a knight or a lord or a baron or something you know like there might be something awesome happening here 
Well, I put his name in and when it spits out the genealogy, honestly, what it had was like pirates, convicts, murderers, thieves. I mean, no joke. If you're wondering how we got to Australia, it was on the convict ships that came out from England. That's, that's it. I started laughing because I thought, gee, I, I married good stock there. And then um, I started to think about mine and my family tree, you know, just, oh my gosh, just adultery and fornication and incest and, and divorce and addiction. And I thought, you can do nothing to change the past. None of us can. It is what it is. That, that will never change. That's exactly what it is. But I thought about my daughters. And one day when they go into spit out a genealogy chart, a family tree chart, and it comes out and the past will be the past. It'll be exactly the same. They'll see on their dad's side, pirates and convicts and criminals. And they'll see here incest and abuse and, and, and divorce and addiction. And then all of a sudden, that's going to be exactly the same. Then all of a sudden they're going to, just see something really different. It's gonna be like the 30th of March, 1996, Nicholas Joseph Kane marries Holy Ghost terrorist, Christine Kane. <laughs> and although we can't change the past from 30th of March, 1996, because Nick and I decided we're drawing a bloodline in the sand and we're saying with us, adultery stops, with us, addiction stops, with us, divorce stops, with us, incest stops, with us, abuse stops, with us, brokenness stops. It stops with us. It's not just about us, it's about the generations that are going to come after us. Sometimes you gotta be willing to say as painful as it is, I'm gonna pick up my mat, not just for me, but for the generations that are gonna come after me. I'm gonna pick up my mat and walk and walk. So Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Do you wanna be healed? It's your choice. Do you wanna be? Same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. You do not have to lie on the mat for the rest of your life, friend. True healing, true deliverance, first and foremost, comes in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And friend, I wonder if you know Him. Not do you know about Him, but do you know Him? Perhaps a friend invited you into this room today and friend, you're not here by accident. You here in the divine timing, the divine plan, the divine purpose of God. You were created by God for a relationship with God and it's Jesus that connects us to God. It's Jesus that connects us to the grace of God. Maybe friend, all you've ever known is religion, but today, as you've been hearing me speak, you're like, I've been going to church, but whatever she's talking about, that Jesus, I, I wanna know Him. You could step over the line today from religion to an authentic relationship with Jesus. Maybe you once walked with God, but if you're honest today, you've been away from God, cold in your heart, maybe even backslidden. Friend, today I wanna invite you to stop running from Him, come back to Him, make your peace with Him. Put Jesus Christ first in your life. He loves you so much, friend. He loves you so much. So there are many people this morning, and this is your morning of destiny. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I I wanna pray for you to come into a life transforming relationship with Jesus. I want every head bowed and every eye closed, friend, from the front to the back, from the left to the right. In this moment, I'm not speaking to the person next to you, I'm speaking to you. And if you say, Chris, I want what you're talking about today. I need a fresh start with Jesus Christ, either for the very first time or I've been away from God, cold in my heart, but I want what you're talking about. I want a fresh start with Jesus. Then friend, let me pray for you. Just a, a simple but powerful prayer right where you're sitting. And if you say, Chris, include me in that prayer. I wanna put Jesus Christ first. Would you just raise your hand wherever you are so I can see who I'm praying for? Thank you. I'm seeing hands go up everywhere. So many of you. I'm seeing you right through to the very back, to the very back. This is wonderful. Every single section of the room, there are dozens of you. Keep those hands going up. Keep those hands going up. I'm seeing you all across this sanctuary. Beautiful. Keep those hands up high. I'm going to pray a prayer. The whole room is going to pray this prayer after me out loud, especially those of you, so many of you with your hands raised. Keep them up high. Jesus sees your hand. This is your prayer to Him. We're going to pray it with you in agreement. So church, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I've raised my hand today because I recognise my need for You. I'm sorry that I've been living my life my own way and ignoring you. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I ask this morning 
that You would forgive me for all of my sins, that You would give me a fresh start today and a hope for the future. I wanna be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ every single day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' Name, Amen.